other parts of South America, but, but in particular from China. And you can see, you can't see the dates on this, but this is around you know, 2000 or so. There's this big kick in the graph, numbers of fossils known, numbers of described species of fossil birds that have been described. And for much of the history of paleontology, we didn't have much information. So lots is going on. We now have a much better understanding of what the shape of bird evolution is like. Here are the living groups. Here are the fossil groups. Several important radiations in the Cretaceous, parts of the family tree in the Cretaceous, including animals called enantiornithines here, the sister group to all of the living birds. Enantiornithines we know were at least as diverse in their numbers of species as the living groups of birds we have today. And they're important to us this evening because the birds from Awada are probably almost entirely enantiornithines. Here's some pictures of other fossil enantiornithines from other parts of the world. These guys are from Argentina. This is a fossil from the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. They were named in 81. Um, lots and lots of species. As I said, this is a group at least as diverse as all of the living groups of birds. Some other pictures of what these fossils look like. Some of the described, the known diversity of enantiornithines from the Cretaceous. Lots of anatomical information. Lots of things can be said about the biology and the evolutionary history of these guys. Not just in Transylvania, there's enantiornithines described from Hatseg also, but it's more incomplete. You can see some pictures of some of the Hatseg specimens here. Incomplete specimens, but complete bones. Three-dimensional bones. And everybody knows where Hatseg is. We were there yesterday and we were there the day before. So Romania has quite a good fossil record for this group of birds from the Cretaceous. This is the specimen, or the, the group of specimens that Marchesh collected um, from a lens um, exposed in the sediments at Uwada. The lens, it's a limestone um, with much eggshell in it. You can see pieces of this lens about a metre long, I remember correctly, something like that, the lens. Yeah? And you can see that this is a, a sediment that's almost eggshell supported, like in the sediment, lots and lots of eggshell pieces. You can see them all the black lines here, pieces here. So very interesting, very important. Um, lots of eggshell, and you can also see complete eggs in this lens. I'm not sure that you can see them very well on this slide, but they're here and here. We now have seven or more complete eggs from this, from this site which is very cool, very important, very interesting for early bird evolution. As you might imagine, there's very little complete egg material that's ever been collected from anywhere in the world. So this is the picture of the paper that we published on this 2012. Again, if anyone's interested, I can for sure give you a copy of this paper. A drowned breeding colony from the late Cretaceous of Transylvania. Some photographs of what the material looks like. Hard to, hard to see, I know, but here you can see eggshell pieces, the outer surface, the inner surface, little baby bird bones. So this accumulation's got a lot of um, little baby bones in it as well. Um, here's another baby bone. Some complete large adult bird bones. This is a scapula. There's the top of a humerus and some other bits and pieces. So tons of eggshell, complete eggs, adult bones and little baby bones also. So our interpretation of this was that the birds were nesting in the area, laying their eggs in the area, maybe they were even taking care of their chicks in the area, and that something happened to this colony. It got flooded by rising water perhaps, which often happens with living nesting groups of birds, ducks for example. This happens quite a lot. So this was ponded together and then we collected, or Matash collected, this accumulation 100 million years later, or sorry, 65, 70 million years later, something like that. Some more images of what these elements look like. These are the characteristics that told us these bones were enantiornithine birds. Some more pictures of some of these elements. You can see, not very well, I apologise, but here's a humerus, a complete bone from the top of the arm the humerus at the top of the arm, other bits and pieces here, um, and uh, yeah, there was another image on here that didn't come out, unfortunately, um, 
since the paper was described in 2012, since the, the association was presented in 2012, Matesh has prepared additional elements from this accumulation, so now we have additional information, additional news about the shapes of the different bones and what, that, what more information there might be from this accumulation. So, part of the interpretation of this as being in antiornithine comes from the morphology of the egg shell, because in birds and in dinosaurs you can tell which groups you're looking at based on the morphology of the egg shell. So different groups of birds, different groups of dinosaurs have different numbers of layers, different shapes to their shell layers if you look at the egg shell with a microscope or with a scanning electron microscope, something like that. So this slide just demonstrates that initial interpretations of this accumulation were consistent with the shell or at least the shell that we look at being in antiornithine in its characteristics. And there's a Swiss guy called Gerard grelet tinner who's done quite a lot of work on this. So this is a, a phylogeny, a tree for birds and dinosaurs based on egg characteristics, eggshell characteristics. Here's some images of the cross section. You can see characteristic features including the number of shell layers. Here's a shell layer, here's another shell layer. Tell us that these aren't advanced birds. These are basal, early evolving Cretaceous birds. Interestingly though, we started to look in more detail at the eggs preserved in this accumulation and we see a more complicated picture now. We see a number of different groups of animals in this accumulation. So that needs more work and is something that we're looking at at the moment. But we do know that there are enantiornithine eggs here, enantiornithine eggshell here, in antiornithine baby bones and in antiornithine adult bones. So I think the overall interpretation will largely remain the same. Here's an SEM image of a baby um, bird bone here. You can see the end of the bone. Here's the broken shaft, one of the wing bones probably. What does it mean if we're correct? Well, what it means, I think, is that we have an association of just one kind of bird we can talk about what the shape of the eggs was. They were bluntly pointed, slightly asymmetric, so not like the egg of a chicken, for example, that's markedly asymmetric. Um, they're, oh, excuse me. they're similar in shape to the eggs of ground-nesting birds today, which is unsurprising given you know, the environment that we're looking at. Um, and actually similar um, to the eggs of some precocial or semi-precocial birds, which we'll talk about in a second, but these are birds that have independent babies. They hatch from their eggs and they run around. They don't need much care from the parent. Okay? So the eggs are hatched in all cases, so the ends of the eggs are broken away, so the babies have come out from the eggs. You don't find juvenile baby bone inside these eggs, but you can still see what the shape of them was. Because this is an association close to water, we're probably looking at an animal that was feeding in water. Um, we know that some other groups of enantiornithines from China, in particular, lived on aquatic feeding. So this is also unsurprising um, for this group of birds. And I, as I mentioned already, flooding is a major cause of mortality in living um, shoreline nesting birds, like ducks, for example. This is consistent with the geology, consistent with the taphonomy of the site. Now just quickly, this is also very important biologically because of the shape of these eggs, okay? And I want to just quickly introduce you to the different reproductive strategies that living birds have. Broadly, they're either precocial, so they have independent young, like these Malay fowl, these birds that, that nest in mounds in Australia, for example, um, the young run around after they leave the egg. They don't need care from the parents. As opposed to most groups of living birds today that spend a lot of time feeding their babies in the egg, in the, in the nest, excuse me, for example. We know that some other groups of birds from the Cretaceous were precocial. They had independent young because this is an egg, an unhatched egg of a bird from China. And this unhatched egg contains a baby with fully formed feathers and feather tracts. So it was able to fly, able to leave the egg and get around and do things pretty much instantly or within you know, a short period of time from leaving the, leaving the egg. 
We can also predict whether these awada birds were precocial or not by comparing them to living groups of birds and also to the rare other examples of eggs preserved in the fossil record. Okay? We also know that there's a constraint, there's something limiting the size of the egg in the evolution of birds because of the shape of the hip. Okay? These birds have fused pelvic bones, so they couldn't lay eggs over a certain size. Unlike living groups of birds that have open pelvises, they can, there's, a, there's less of a constraint on the evolution of the size of the egg. And Confucius Sornis, shown here, one other well-known bird from the Cretaceous, um, you can predict the egg size of Confucius Sornis from the shape of its pelvis. Okay? We know that its egg size was relatively small compared to its body mass. This is probably also what was happening with these Awada birds. We know the egg size in this case. So from the egg size, and we know that the pubis was fused, we can look at the other long bones in the adults, the other bones in the association, and predict what the body mass of this bird was likely to have been. Okay, and this graph just shows you how this animal has a precocially consistent egg size and probably a precocially consistent body mass also, which is very important, very interesting, if we want to try to predict how these birds were going about their lives. So, where do these modes, where do these evolutionary strategies happen in the tree of birds? Well, almost certainly, um, precociality is a fatal condition within living birds, and taking care of your babies is something that happens further up the evolutionary tree maybe even associated with the radiation, the evolution of the living groups of birds, which is interesting. So, in terms of surviving the end Cretaceous mass extinction, which is something that the living groups of birds did do, but things like enantiornithines and other groups of birds in the Cretaceous did not do, we know that there were uh, two other groups, at least, in the Cretaceous in terms of birds, that didn't make it through the end Cretaceous mass extinction, yet living birds did. And maybe this evolution of egg shape, evolution of egg size, evolution of taking care of your babies, which is linked to this, we know, is, is one thing that may have aided or, or been a factor in the success of birds at the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. So hopefully I've convinced you that we have good evidence Great fossils from Awada about this Transylvanian bird nesting colony and what it might mean for the biology of some of these guys. Colleen made this. I had to show it to you. Thank you again for the time. <laughs>